but how do I communicate? How do I, how do I truly, you know, the biggest part of, or the, the biggest problem with talking is listening. Welcome to Clicks and Bricks Podcast. We talk about the entrepreneur mindset. If you get one shot at this, what kind of shot are you going to take? If we forget who we are, they're going to forget who you are. And you've got an adversity story that's out of this world. Everything from that Main Street brick and mortar to that billion dollar manufacturer. Welcome back to Clicks and Bricks. Today I've got Brigetta from the center of NLP. I am super excited to talk to her. This is Neuro Linguistic patterns, I think. I'm not 100% sure. How are you doing today, Brigetta? Oh, thank you so much for having me, Ken. I am doing fantastic now that I get to be here on your show. Thank you so much. We actually met just a couple of weeks ago through Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm not sure which one. And and the stuff that you're doing, I just, I, I was uh, very interested in. And a lot of the same kind of personal work that I've been doing for the last couple of years seemed to line up really well. So before we get to know Brigetta a little bit, can you tell us what the Center of NLP is all about? Yes, absolutely. And you know what? First of all, congratulations for working on yourself because that's hard work. (laughs) And most people don't even start it because it's like, oh, that means I need to actually not just look in the mirror to apply my makeup or to fix my hair, especially in your case, Ken, Um, (laughs) but, but to... But to actually take a look in the mirror and go, where can I grow? Where can I improve? And as humans, we and specifically as leaders in in our professional world and as family members, it would be beneficial if we could have a real look in the mirror and, and see, you know, not where do we fail or where our shortcomings are, but where is there room to grow? And we all continuously, no matter how old or young you are or how well-educated or not you are, there's always room to grow. So NLP, what is it? Neuro Linguistic Programming. That's a mouthful. Neuro is your brain. It's your operating system, is where your thoughts um, originate. It's where your experiences, your beliefs are stored. It's where you take in information and you find a file cabinet, if you will, somewhere in here, and you store the information. Now, when we store information, we delete, distort, and generalize. And I'm not going to go into that, but just kind of know that the, what's going on outward, what we're taking in from an outside, say, event of us just having a conversation is usually not the same thing as we are storing it internally because we are either looking for a baseline of where have we heard something similar to that, or does it really apply to my life? And maybe it does in this and this and this context. So we're looking at where does it apply? And and through that application within ourselves, we delete, distort, or generalize the information that we're taking in just to make sense of it, or else we're just going to go and complete and utter, you know, overwhelm. So that's the neuro side. Linguistic is the communication, and though although I'm pointing at my mouth, Ken, communication is so much more than the words that we're saying or how we're saying it. Because sometimes I have to tell my face to shut up separately. That's a real story, and it happens yes. very often. So the biggest part of our communication is actually the nonverbal side and not the verbal side, the our body language. And what it means and 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 what we're saying without saying something. So that's the communication, the linguistic side. And then the programming, you 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 said patterns, and it's both uh correct because we have over years, specifically when we were young and during our imprint phase, we are taking in information and we are we're being programmed, if you will, by um, our teachers, our thought leaders, religious leaders, friends, family, mom, dad, and uncle, siblings. And although they didn't, you know, sit down and say, okay, uh, I'm going to program you now, press record now, um, we're being, we're taking in information, we're taking in 
you know, sayings of when someone says something over and over and over again, we just had this conversation, you know, when your dad tells you uh, for the biggest part of your life that the money does not, is not just found on the street, which is a German saying, or in, in America, we would say the money doesn't grow on trees. If you hear that over and over and over again, it's going to become your part of your belief system. You are being programmed to believe that. So, right. and that comes in patterns. So that is the programming part. So to a very short question, a very long answer. All right. Let's dive in on what you just said, because it's hilarious to me that that phrase has come up multiple times in the last couple of days for me. Money doesn't grow on trees. It's a true statement. Why is that a bad thing to hear repeatedly as you grow up? Yeah. So let me and let me come back to this phrase and let me give you a different phrase. So um, I'm not just an owner and a CEO of one school for adults. I also have a school for children, a Montessori school. And when I first started the Montessori school, I would hear parents tell their children that they are dumb. And actually, I just heard the neighbor tell them to their own child, you know, stop being dumb or stop being stupid. Wow. Well, stop is the is not is is deleted by our brain, by our neuro strategies. And all we're hearing is the command of be stupid or don't touch the stove. There's a command to touch the stove. Right. Doesn't hear the, the conscious mind does not hear the don't. So when we hear something over and over and over again, we take it in. If if our mom, if my mom tells me that I'm dumb, oh my gosh, mom knows a lot. It must be true. If my dad tells me that money doesn't grow on trees, then hmm, well, he's right. So I so I'm I, I make the conclusion out of that. I draw the conclusion out of that. I gotta work really, 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 really hard. And I gotta make life miserable for me and my entire family and my entire team to because money does not grow on trees. There. Right. Yeah, because when we hear that, it's a negative generally, right? It's like, oh, you can't. No, you can't have the the soda at the drive through because money doesn't grow on trees. So we always hear it in this limiting kind of mantra of, oh, you can't have that because money's scarce, right? Which mm -hmm. is, I mean, we live in America. They print that stuff every single day. And, and okay, so let's t let's take that further. What do they print it on? Paper. Paper. What's paper made of? Trees. Hello. Yeah, there's plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. We can so regrow this. Exactly. So, so money does grow on trees. Hello. <laughs> yes. Oh, X. If you want to get wildly technical, then yes, absolutely. That's probably <laughs> some smart ass comment that I would have made to my parents when I was a kid as well. <laughs> And you know what? And it takes those smart ass, com smart ass comments because, you know, if we peel back all the layers, it's it's ridiculous what we just said. But it kind of bursts that belief system. I, I call the I call belief system a BS. Right. Okay. And we can choose. Is it BS? Is it a belief system or is it not? Can I burst it? Can I shatter it? Can I dissolve it? Can I bust that myth? Or is there something that actually serves me in a belief system? Right. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite lines from my favorite director, Kevin Smith, in one of his movies, he said something about beliefs are dangerous because people will die for their beliefs. So ideas are really what we need more of, right? Because ideas can change. They're, they're, it's okay to change those. And belief systems that aren't necessarily accurate, we do all, people do all kinds of crazy stuff because of the belief systems. I, the show is more about how you started your company, but I think the value to the listeners here is so much more important to get through. Why are, can you give us an example of a limiting belief and, and how that is so negative for an entrepreneur today? Yeah. So let's, t let's take the money doesn't grow on trees or the belief system of the root of all evil um, money is the root of all evil. Right. So if someone if someone truly believes that, oh, you know, I, it's I'm not worth. Then then the the next step is I am not worthy to have money because I don't 
I don't want to be evil and I'm not worthy of having money. And I actually don't want to go down that route. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to stand in front of judgment when I die. And then, you know, everything falls apart. So the, as a, as a business owner, whichever beliefs we have, may it be around money, may it be around success, may it be around clients. You know what? For the longest time, as a young business owner coming from Germany to the U.S. to build my first business, I got to say, Ken, I was really cocky. I was. That that tooth got pulled pretty quick. Was it cocky But I was really cocky. Yeah, uh, both. But I was really if if you if you'd ask my staff, they're like, no, 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 she was. Yeah, she was confident, but she was also really cocky. (laughs) Right. Because I came with the belief, first of all, that I knew everything. You know, I'm from Germany. I hold two degrees. Get out of my way. Right. I got this. So there was a belief there. Um, I also believe that I had to be so confident to almost be an a-hole. Not just to my staff, but to my to my clients, and 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 that's what I thought I learned to be confident. That's what I thought I need to exude to just kind of bulldoze over everyone and just say I got this. Um, until I learned, and I actually repl- replaced that belief system with, you know what, you can be kind and confident. You can actually love your clients and there's going to be even more. I thought I had to be an a-hole and get in order to get more clients. But the more I reframed that belief system, I first had to become aware of it, reframed it, and then I, I showed more appreciation. I actually developed a love for my clients. And as a German businesswoman, that was like oh, unheard of. And I thought, man, but this is this actually works. This is a great belief system. I will keep yeah. it. I, and I, we should probably do a whole nother show. I've got some friends from Germany. And I do a lot of business in uh, with German companies. And the mindset is different on on customer service, right? It's it's a different oh. <laughs> it's a different mindset, and that's capitalist versus socialist countries. And there's there's a whole lot of stuff there. And that's a whole nother probably a whole nother show or series of shows. The differences between. Um, b2c business right because it's drastically different yes. um, it is totally okay but moving forward we want to get into your company when did you move to the states 2004 2004 so not too long ago really in, in, well, in the, almost 20 years 20 yeah years. we're going on 19 years yeah 2004 i guess as, as i age my time is getting more and more warped yeah. so and <laughs> you so you moved this to the united states in 2004 Was it too open a business or was it for something, some other reason? So in 2001, my husband and I got married. We met in 1999 and we partied like it was 1999 for our wedding. And um, in 2001, we got married and I was working for a publishing house and he was working for a different publishing house. I was in the sales department. He was in the uh, editing and journalism uh, writing department. So we didn't really see if you have ever, if you know anything about publishing, we really didn't see eye to eye because, you know, our department didn't like their department and their department doesn't like our department. We're the ones that say, hey, XYZ wants to put a, a, a full page ad in. You got to write about them on page three. And they're like, no, I don't want to do that. Right. So that's that that's our background. And um, we both loved what we did, and we also wanted to have children. So I said, you know, when I travel, and I traveled a lot for work, when I travel, I want our children to go to a Montessori school. Great. So, you know, uh, we got married. I became pregnant. And I wanted to sign up our daughter, who wasn't even born at the time, for Montessori school for daycare. And they had a three-year wait list. And I was like, well, shoot. I don't want to wait three years to go back to my work. And Germany does have great laws um, that will allow mom and or dad to stay home um, for an extended period of time and you get paid. But I love I love what I did. And um, I said, you know what? Hmm, There's an opportunity here. I am going to build a Montessori school. I have a social pedagogy degree. I I am an educated teacher. I never 
actually did anything with it. I also have a marketing degree. I actually have the best of both worlds. Let me, let's create a Montessori school. And if you know anything about business in Germany, very bureaucratic, you know, a ton of red tape and rules. So we kept it very, very small to four children, which was more of a daycare than a school. But I went through the education for the Montessori methodology in addition to my social pedagogy and teaching degree. And my husband and I, when we met, we said, hey, you know, at one point we want to move to the States. And as we're growing the business and it was, you know, I loved the Montessori method. I did that because I never went to Montessori school, which is a very hands-on, one-on-one kind of education. I said, I want our children to continue to grow in that. And we wanted to have more than one child. And I said, let's move to the States now. And he's like, okay, so what does that take? We had this conversation in 2002. Amelie, our oldest, was born in June 2002. I started developing a business plan of scaling the business. And I said, let's go to the States. Great. And we found a home in a small town in Tennessee uh, where we could start that had two entrances where we could start the school. We would max out at seven children and then, you know, scale the business in in a bigger building. So we did all of that. And, you know, we did that on our own time and dime. I uh, left the publishing house that I worked with was a Murdoch holding. My husband continued writing from the States for the uh, was a billboard magazine for Germany. And we just made it work. We didn't, we weren't expats as you might know them, you know, where a company would bring you over, you would be here on a two year assignment, and then they would take you back to your uh, place of origin. So we just did that. And I think that's where, you know, looking back, that's where some of my cockiness came from because it wasn't a small undertaking. We had oh. one. We had one toddler in one hand. We had, I had my husband the other. We said, let's do it. And then we came to the States. We, we built the school. Um, I became pregnant again. We had our second daughter. We call her our anchor child, <laughs> which we don't even think of. But we call her that. <laughs> Wonderful. I love so, it. Okay. Yeah, here we are. So did you have friends and family in Tennessee or were you just in an island by yourself? Uh, yes and no. So my, my father was a missionary for the church of God who had their headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee. Okay. So he knew his way around and that helped us. So we didn't really have family there, but we had somewhat of an infrastructure. We knew someone that would allow us to tap into that infrastructure. Wonderful. When you made the decision to come to the States and open the school, Obviously, that's a lot of travel back and forth, wildly expensive, I'm sure. Um, only having four students, I'm sure that the, you know, the money wasn't you know, overly abundant at the time. What was it that gave you the confidence to max out the occupancy of that new school when you moved to the States, not knowing a whole lot of people, not knowing the area, not knowing that I guess at the time you probably knew that there was a difference in consumer behavior, but you didn't realize how drastic it might be, right? So I, I how did you find idea. that confidence? Yeah, that's a great question. So I I am a big planner. I'm I'm a first and foremost I'm a huge action taker, but I'm also a big planner, and I think for me that works really really well. Um, if you'd ask my husband, he'd probably say something else. Um, <laughs> but um, I did a great job without me pounding my, you know, myself on the shoulders. I did a great job in creating the business plan and doing all of the marketing studies and the research. And, and so when we came to the States, I knew my take on where my where my stance was in the community. It's a very small community. It's it's the second largest Cleveland, but it's a very small Cleveland. Okay. It's in Tennessee. If you know anything about Tennessee in the Chattanooga area, it is the buckle of the Bible Belt. So here I am coming to the buckle of the Bible Belt with um, an interesting methodology to a, a, a community that only has Christian churches. A Christian uh, daycares, right? right? So all they know is 
you know, they're, they're Christian daycares. And here I come with a very open mind from Germany with a methodology that is very open-minded because within the methodology, we don't just look at Christianity. We look at all world religions. We, we give the children opportunities to soak in information and learn differences, not just similarities, but differences in how they can become similarities and how we can have that interaction with the other that is that things and feels and looks and sounds different. And I wanted that for our children. So going into the small community, the first thing that I did um, was get a, became a, become a member at the chamber of commerce. And the second thing I did was I went to the small business development center and I just, I, I sat there for probably every week for the first half year. And I just wrapped myself around how business is done in the United States. And those two things, I didn't want to spend the $257 to become a member of the Chamber of Commerce, but I knew that if I wouldn't, I would not have the growth as quickly as I wanted. And out of that, I got my first two kids within like weeks. And they were from a German family or from a German mother who married an American who lived in the community. And they wanted me to continue to speak German to the kids. Oh, that was my twist. All right. Different is better than better, right? Montessori schools are different than traditional schools in the U S and Catholic schools by far, but adding another difference of having German speaking there is, is another huge difference. And for business owners out there, having those differentiators are huge, right? Um, and lean yeah. on those hard, right? If you have something that differentiates you, makes you different from everybody else, that's what you need to lean on if you're looking for your marketing approach or whatever that might be. Brilliant. So Chamber of Commerce is frequently looked over. The local business centers or small business centers are looked over. Local BNIs are generally looked over for new startups, right? Those kinds of, and it's tedious. I don't know anybody that really loves doing them, uh, but- it is a good place to meet people, leaders in the community, and talk. Um, you're going to get pitched to, though, if you're going to do that. It just yes. is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I probably didn't even realize that other people were trying to pitch me, but <laughs> I learned a big lesson. I think that's another lesson for for business owners. I learned how to network. As a German, I did. I did not know how to network. I don't know what that meant. Oh, really? Right. So, no. No. Okay. Um, that that was foreign to me. And I, I, I started realizing building relationships and just you know, keeping your mouth shut and listening to others, that was a big lesson I had to learn. It's a hard one. And, and it's a lesson that I have to learn and I have to continually repeat it inside my head, right? You know, we do what we do because we love it, right? I love hanging out and just talking about people's businesses together, right? I, I yeah. love your sign behind you. It says, listen to relate, not to respond. And one thing that I work with my students a lot on is um, react or respond instead of react, right? Yeah. I want you to take mm-hmm. the information in and I want you to respond to it. I don't want you just to react to it. So I like to listen to relate and not respond is another uh, it's a different avenue for that to really understand what your person's talking about. And I think we just miss that so frequently in today's society with batch chats and TikToks and tweets and all that fun stuff where um, a lot of the animosity comes from short out of context data. Right. And we're not quick to react, very quick to react. Yes. Yeah, so, I really love that. Now, talk to more about your Montessori school than the center of NLP, I think. When did you start the center for NLP? So in my in my work in, in building and scaling the business, started with you know two kids, then I had my own two kids, then we quickly outgrew the seven kids that I was able to have in my house. We, we built a, a, a big building, uh, moved into the building. 
I remember calling my sister in Germany and I said, I don't know how I'm going to fill this building. And she says, you have come so far and we all don't know really how you did it. And I'm like, oh, looking back, I really don't know how I did it. Right. I just went, you know, faith was a big part of it. One day at a time. Um, and, and she says, that's exactly how it's going to fill. Today, we have 125 students. So we've moved wow. several times in the meantime. And um, as I was scaling the business, as I was building the business, I had a good, you know, 15 teachers. We had several classrooms. And and I was still in this, you know, very German mindset of what I described earlier. And I I was great in onboarding new teachers. In Cleveland, Tennessee, there are not a whole lot of Montessori teachers found. So I found great, great talented teachers. And I would um I would personally teach them in the Montessori method, and then I would send them to get their Montessori uh, diploma, which was, you know, an, a, a pretty big investment. It was a, about a three and a half, four thousand dollar investment per teacher. So I was great in onboarding teachers. I was great in recruiting teachers. I was great in, you know, teaching them and enrolling them and, and, and having them go through the Montessori method, but I wasn't good at keeping them. And I became a revolving door for teachers. And at the, in the first years, Ken, I said, they're all dummies. They don't know an opportunity when they see one. Let them go, you know, until I finally did the math. I was like, this is really hurting me. This is killing my time. This is killing yeah. my resources, killing money like lots. I'm not keeping them. And it the, the more it, it continued the more parents just pulled their kids out. They're like, Hey, something's going on. You know, she, she is not keeping teachers. She has a huge turnaround in staff. Something's right. up and we're pulling our kids. Now I'm not just, you know, feeling the pain over on the, the money that I'm losing with the teachers. Now I'm missing tuition payments. I am going to miss the future tuition payments because our school goes through middle school so if I on if if I enroll these kids at 18 months old, I'm missing out on a whole lot of tuition in the future. Right. So that's when I finally, finally it took me a while to really take a deeper look in the mirror and say, okay, so who's the dummy here? And I had to, you know instead of pointing finger, fingers outward, I had to look inward and go, okay, what is it that I don't know? Because up until that point, I was cocky. I was like, oh, I already know everything. Right. I have all these degrees and, you know, cross cultures and blah, blah, blah. What is it that I don't know? And what I really did know was how to listen. And, and I realized that. And I said, but I, what, I have a degree in freaking communications. I have a marketing degree. But how do I communicate? How do I how do I truly, you know, the biggest part of or the the biggest problem with talking is listening. We already established that. And I said, okay, so what am I missing? And who can help me in filling in those blanks that I'm clearly missing? And that's how I found NLP. I started talking to people and they're like, yeah, neurolinguistic programming and really helped me to get better in communication. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. So I looked up NLP and I looked where, you know, I could find more information. And there's a center in Atlanta, Chattanooga or Cleveland is about two hours from Atlanta. I said to my husband, I signed us up for this course. We're going to go to this course we're going to become better communicators, literally how the conversation went. And we did that. And out of that, um, I kind of started a self-development journey, uh, went to other courses outside of NLP. But as I was sitting in those courses, I was like, all of these speakers have something in common. And that is the strategies of neurolinguistic programming. And I was fascinated by it. And I realized that a lot of the communication strategies that I actually use really well with children wasn't so good with adults, but with children, I did it really, really well. I realized that's what I've been doing just very naturally in my sales communication. When I would sell, you know, when I was in marketing for the publishing house, 
all of the strategies that I made use of very in very um unintentional, if you will, but just out of my own, you know, being, they were NLP strategies. And I was like, that's fascinating because now I can teach it to others. And now I can actually do them intentionally and use them intentionally. That's how I became familiar with NLP. Right. Okay. I I can see I've got some ideas on on where your little buckets were. And I think I have a lot of those same problems. I, I operate data centers during the day, very no subjectivity at all, right? Everything is just bam, bam, bam. And when you're doing the sales stuff and all those things, you're just naturally talking with people, right? You're having a good time, you're communicating, but you get caught up in the efficiencies of onboarding and all of these things. And when you get caught up in that mindset, it's it's very abrasive, I've been called. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Over time. And it's yeah. And it's the time to say, oh, I'm not talking with the computer. I'm talking with real people here. And they have emotions and they're they might have had a really bad day this morning and they just need a quick compliment to change their entire life. Right. So I think it's important for us to remember that we're always talking to real people. Mm-hmm. And yeah. To just relax a little bit. And it's at the end of the day, the outcome of the conversation if they're doing business with you or not doing business with you is okay. As long as you both leave the conversation. Feeling good. In a happy, wholesome place. Right. Not not like, Oh my gosh, I got beat up in that phone call or whatever. (laughs) Right. And you know, we do sales every day. um, And that's, that's a very challenging job. It makes you, people are really mean when you pick up the phone and call them (laughs) a lot of times. So it's important stuff. On the sales I side, I, I just want to pull as much value out as we can from you on the NLP. Um, I have on both sides of the fence, right? Sales guys are always struggling because they're just constantly bombarded with negativity, right? If you if you do 200 dials a day, you might get 30 pickups and 10 of them told you to F off and the rest were voicemails. So they're dealing with that negativity all day long, right? But salespeople are a different breed. They tend to brush that stuff off. We have thick skin. It, if there's somebody that's struggling in that moment, right? They're they're just tired. They're beat up. And they're like, man, I don't want to make another phone call because after a while, it, it's traumatic, right? You're constantly being told no. And you got all these micro, ch- uh, micro traumas, really, of getting yelled at and stuff like that. What are some tricks that they could use themselves on this for the sales team to overcome that? I guess it's a, it's almost a fear of making the next phone call because they don't want to get yelled at again. Yeah, and I think it starts out with great question. It starts out with realizing who who am I? What am what's what which cloth am I made of? And what are my values? And how do I take information in? Now, I teach the V8 communications engine. Let me go through them really quick. So one side of the V8 engine is the value side. So what does one value? Are they more of a planner? Are they more of an action taker? Are they more of a carer? Or do they really appreciate logic and knowledge? On the other side of the V8 engine are the representational systems of how we store and take in information. Is it more visual? visually? Is it more... Um, kinesthetically by feeling? Is it more auditorily by hearing? Or is it more auditory digitally by thinking it through? So as a salesperson, most of the time, what I have seen, and I have worked with many sales teams um, across the globe, the really good ones are highly visual and are action takers. So they they see they're they're, you know, in big companies, the 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 visionaries are action takers. They risk is not in their vocabulary. They literally build the plane on the way down. You know, they see me what the plane's going to be and boy, is it blinged out. And they, they just go for it, right? And they constantly see the next step ahead of them. Now, if someone, and, and again, working with a lot of sales teams, if someone in the sales team is a high nurturing person and all they do and live for and value is caring for others, their little soul gets crushed because they they are high nurturer and they're kinesthetic. So their feelings 
are being crushed. Their whole value system is being crushed. Their whole persona is being crushed. They are in the wrong place. If you are a nurturer, high kinesthetic, and you are working in a sales team that is probably led by a high action, high visionary, you are not set up for success, honey. Right. You're just not. So should and, he just I leave? That's where it starts out. Should, should that person just say, hey, this job is not for me. I'm not a salesperson. That person might not even see it because they say, all I want to do is help these people. Right. That they're calling. But they don't see me because they're so outwardly oriented in helping others that, you know, when someone picks up the phone and 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 gives them a bird or, or birds them off or whatever, they're like, but I just want to help you. But they're like, I don't want to be helped. Yeah. And my advice to those people is put down the phone and start making TikToks about your products <laughs> and, your product and make them call you. Right. And then only right. only talk to people that are actually seeking your services, but those are more order takers than the sales guys. And it's a little bit different. And that just goes to, for the leaders, making sure that you keep an open mind and you're moving people around on your team to what best suits them. Right. There's plenty of work yeah. for us all to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. Yeah. It, that's really where it starts out. So you got to take inventory of who you are and what you value. And then you got to meet the other person on the line to where they're at. And you said something earlier, you know, people have bad days. And when they come on the phone with you and they flick you off, that has nothing to do with you. No, nothing. nothing. Zero. And when you can think of, you know, when you can come from Remember what I said earlier, we delete, distort, and generalize information. When we can show appreciation of where that person is in their entire mindset and 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 realize it has nothing to do with me. No. They're gonna you're gonna be happy. Well, and if you can make a connection with that person, uh, uh, as a sales team, if you can make a connection with the person on the other side of the phone, your job not only became a lot easier, it became fun. If it's so rigorous, if that that process is so rigorous and so abrasive, then you're right. It's not fun for the salesperson. It's not fun for the person that's receiving it. Right. But if you are able to to meet that person, that other person where they're at, you're right. They're going to stick around. Yes. They're going to go. Ken actually took time to listen to me. Yes. And all you need to do, you know, I, I tell the, the the folks that I that I train. Silence is your best friend. Just shut up and be quiet and let them speak. It and says. take notes. Absolutely. And take notes. You know, I give them specific um, details on, on what to take notes. Listen to words that they uh, use more than twice, three times, four times, five times. And write that down and and put that in what you're saying back to them subconsciously that immediately is like, Oh, they understand me. Right. They will not pick up on that word unless you use it 10 times in one sentence. Also write down. What is it that they value? If they already say, I, you know, I don't have time. I need to be there. I need to do this. I'm, you know, blah, 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 closing all these deals. You already know you have an action taker. So speak to that. Hey, I know you don't have a whole lot of time. Actually, I don't have either, but let's make this quick and easy. Oh, quick and easy. Yeah, that speaks to my values. Yep. I tell if you're talking, I try to help the sales solicitors, right? I tell them, like, look, I value opportunity. What what is my opportunity if I'm gonna do business with you? And I really try to, and it's amazing to me how many salespeople don't know how to react to that. It is they just so it. bizarre. But I know. Yeah. And and on the flip side. The person that values knowledge and logic, they take more time. Yes. Oh, I have another question. Great. What's your other question? And then stick around. But here's so here's the real problem. Ken, the salesperson is a high action taker. And when you is when the salesperson is on the phone with a knowledge person that has more question and needs to know all the nitty-gritty details, the action taker gets either bored or frustrated or, you know, loses interest. Where the other person, if we would just take enough time to listen to their questions, 
And even if we don't have the answers, hey, I'm going to write down all of those questions. I'm going to put them in an email. I'm going to send them back to you. Or if someone is, is all about it, it, I don't care what you have to sell me. I care about you listening to the problem that I have right now. And when you listen to that problem, you're probably going to be able to offer the solution that you have. Or a custom solution that might solve their need as well, depending on what kind of business you have. I do a lot right. of custom solutions. I like custom solutions more than just about anything else. All right. Yeah. Brigida, if somebody's out there and they're watching the show, and I, I think we could probably have this conversation all day long about buying shift and set changes and stuff like that. But if somebody's watching the show and like, man, I really, I really dig Brigida. I'd like to do work with her. I, I, I'm interested in this neurolinguistic programming stuff, right? I want to move forward with it. Who can you help the most? Like, who is your ideal client? Anyone that has ears, eyes, and a mouth. Um, mostly, and this is everyone, right? right. But I, I mostly work with two sorts of people. Trainers, for large organizations that do training, they become, they are training the people within their organization and I train them so they can pa pass on the, the uh, richness. So trainers of organizations, HR folks, you know, research and development um, and business owners, specifically business owners that have finally realized they're not the dummies. It's actually me and I need to do something, right? So I've basically cloned my avatar. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We help the people that we were a year or two, three, five years ago, right? That's that's our the person we can help the most generally. So I love it. And if somebody wanted to learn more about you, where what's the best place for them to, to go to get the best information about you and your program and your business? Super simple. On the World Wide Web, centerofnlp.com, centerofnlp.com. Or if you forget that, which I don't think you'll ever forget that, Brigitte Höfele, which is a hard, a, hard, a lot harder to spell than center of NLP. If you just Google me, there's only one me out there and that'll lead you there too. Wonderful. All right. And I've got one last question for you. And it's a doozy. Throughout this Bring entire it. process... You've started multiple companies, right? One in Germany, very small, moved to the States, scaled it and grew. And then now the Center for NLP, which is another company. Can you give us a story of one of your, one thing that you had to overcome that you just didn't know how to do it? And, and what was the tools that helped you get over that hurdle? Because I'm sure that through all of this, there were a lot of times that a lot of other people might have quit and walked away. And that's what makes successful business owners different than the people that shut down their business and go back to the nine to five is that we have this ability to look at doom and say, oh, we're going to make it through this. And I would love yeah. to hear a story that you've had that was a challenging moment that you overcame. And how did you overcome that? Yeah. So this, the, the biggest story, I believe there are two big stories in, in, uh, since I've been in business and, and built businesses, one I already shared with you, you know, you're looking outward, they're dummies. That's, that was definitely one. And NLP was the solution for that. 2008 was another one. And in 2008, after I finally realized I got to do the work on myself um, and I had great, uh, great staff, uh, great parents that supported the school, that paid tuition, 2008 hit and I had a lot of uh, parents that brought their children to my school from real estate, mortgage, insurance folks. And overnight, they pulled their children. They're like, we can't afford this anymore. We're pulling our children. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I remember talking to my husband. I said two things. Either I'm going to go down. I'm going to not be able to keep the doors to the school open because I have too many uh, tuition, uh, too many paying tuition clients leaving, or I'm going to start really digging deeper in my own mindset. And that's when I started reading more about companies that overcome adversities and challenging times and how they are actually stronger by, by pushing through 
by doing whatever it takes. And I just started studying companies like that. And I started really not, I didn't do anything outward, Ken, looking back. It was more of an inside job. And I used the time because it was a downtime. I had to let teachers go. That was a rough, rough, you know, I finally, I finally figured it out. And I finally was able to keep these teachers. And I was like, no, I didn't know it was horrible, but it was a lesson for me. And it was growth of me like, okay, now I have these, this great talent and I need to let them go. And I maintained a relationship and, and a lot of them I brought back when we were, you know, standing on both feet again, but it was more of an inside job than anything else. And I did a lot of growth through that. And through that, I was scouted by the largest self-development company in the world, and they invited me to speak on their stages because I was able to push through the adversity. And I was able to um, continue to to not let that fire inside of me die. It it continued, you know, I did everything to uh, continue to kindle that fire when even when it went out and when it went really, really low, I... (laughs) I, I I blew it again and it and it and it and it grew to something bigger again. And honestly, if, if 2008 would have not been here, I don't know if we would have a middle school today. I don't know if we would have 125 students today. I don't know if I would be the CEO of the Center of NLP today. I don't know if I would have spoken on large stages around the world with people like Tony Robbins and Gary Vee and such. Yeah, the things that can happen. Absolutely. So 2008, big downturn, muscled through, and reading was a big one for you. I, doing research on other companies. I'm the same, and on the NLP side, for me, my biggest uh, resolution or victory or tool that I've used to help me overcome challenging times is I've created, uh, for different companies, I call them different things. If I Like my technical company, we call it our SMAC, which is a term created by Southwest Airlines, which is systematical, methodical, and consistent rule set. At my boxing school, we call it our core values, right? But it's just a set of rules that we, it's our core values that we go through every single day so that they become part of us, right? Um, and they're, they're different things for different kinds of companies. But, you know, that, that programming of every single day, we read those core values and we see them, they're in front of us all the time. That's programming us to know in times of of the dark side, right? Whenever we're like, when our, when our fire's almost out, those core values are something you can look at and read and they give you energy and they, they build that flame back up. So that was the one, t- the, the one tool that I can look at and say, oh, that's, that's something that's replicatable to everybody in the world to do is come up with a list of five to 20 core values that you're gonna look at and read out loud every single day and um, that has helped me so much in in life in my career. So if, if it helps somebody out, I, I hope it I hope it helps change them too. Yeah, and I, I love that because the core values at the end is you know the purpose. Why are you doing it? And I always every, every day I looked at my children. I was I'm doing this for you. Right. What what kind of mother and businesswoman would I be if I would say I quit now? Right. Right. What what kind of example would that set? And to this day, my children, they're 17 and 20 now. They're like, Mom, you're the toughest. You're the toughest cookie that we know. We look up to you. Yes. And when we're like when we're ready to take our to take our tail between our legs and go, this is not working. We overthink that one, twice, three times, because what would mom do? Right. And those are the times you need the most energy. Right. And the, yeah. to overcome those. um, and I would actually say that's the time that I can go unconscious and just muscle through through, through yeah. some, some big times. But mm-hmm. anyway, congratulations on your success, your migration to the United States. I, I'm, we're, we're very, very happy to have you. I'm, I'm just one ambassador for this United States of this millions <laughs> of people. Um, but and, and, the, and the help that you're doing, the Montessori School is wonderful. Um, and the NLP, I think everybody, every business leader, if you're not there yet, Right. It's something that you could use. And, sure. and I'm, I'm lying to you. I have got one more question. 
at what point, it, it's so sad to me that I think, and, and I don't know the actual numbers, but I'm going to bet 90% of the people out in the world today find NLP uh, or some kind of therapy in the moments of the most distressed, right? How can somebody, and maybe it's not possible, maybe you have to go through that dark time to, to start working on yourself. I don't know. But it would be great if we could convince people that, hey, you know, out of college, start working on these things, right? These these are important things that you have to have as a business leader. I'm sure there's some business leaders that don't need to have them. They 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 do everything perfectly on the first try and and they get they knock it out of the park. But everybody I've ever met <laughs> has dealt with struggles. How can we tell people so. and educate them that hey, this is important stuff and get ahead of the curve instead of waiting for, you know, my liver failed of alcohol. Right. So and before I started really looking at this stuff, you had a mass exodus of employees before you really started like these negative events happen before we start. I would love to find a way to start teaching this stuff before the big negative events starts. I agree with you. And I agree that, you know, NLP should be taught not in high school, but in university for sure, colleges and People ask me, Brigida, how in the world do you do a jump from a Montessori school to a center of NLP? And I say, it's all about expert modeling, which is one of the strategies of NLP. And it's the, exactly what I said earlier about you know my children. I am a model. I model for my children. When the going gets tough, what do you do? And if I just you know go in bed and 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 go under the covers. I model for them just to, you know, shy away from the challenges and the adversities. Right. So it starts, it starts with us right now. The children are our future and we want them, we want to equip them with great strategies to overcome adversities, not in the time when the going gets tough or the dark dot times, but actually before it starts with me, it actually should have started. It should have, and I don't want to shoot over my parents. Um, and it's too late now for them to give in me the strategies, right? But I can I can break that pattern, and I have broken that pattern and pass it on not just to my children, but to my community. Wherever I am, I'm constantly modeling good communication to other people. So I think it's for us, just like kindness. When we go out and we model kindness, when we model you know, paying it forward when we model uh, being actually a, um, a, a, a a kind driver on the interstate, whatever it is, we're constantly modeling. You guys know what I'm talking Absolutely. about. I, I, have, I have been the, I have been the asshole on the road more times than I care to admit. So uh, you and I, my friend, you and I, not a, I'm not a proud better. moment. I'm getting not better. A proud I, moment. My, my patience is growing by the day. Brigitte, I've had such yeah. a blast talking. Modeling with you. patience. Yes. Uh, is there anything you would like to leave the audience with before we go? Listen more. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I hope you have a great day and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, Ken. That's it for today's show, folks. I hope you have a great day. Get to work.